So there's a lot of movement and it does feel a bit more musical than my previous, previous albums where they were hyper-focused on just voice. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the TF Cast. I'm your host Willis. Hey Grum here, it is November 8th here in the Solarium. And I'm your host Jacob Basis. Today with us we have Nicholas on behalf of his project I Cut People. You know, tell us about the project, tell us what's coming out and uh, how you got involved with this. Yeah. Um, so the project began in 2005. Um, <clears throat> so it's been around for about two decades. Uh, I, what the, what the music is, is, um, it's sample based. It kind of falls under the, the, uh, genre of plunder phonics, uh, which mm. was defined by John Oswald. Uh, and this type of music is sampling from music sources that are recognizable. <clears throat> the one thing that I do a little bit differently is that I typically will sample mostly voice. Um, television, radio, um, I do typically uh, uh, sample pop music as well, or really any type of music for that matter. And... Uh, when I get these samples, I will get a sound file. I will go through the sound file. I will cut out bits and pieces. I'll make directories. Um, sometimes I'll have directories that are like named nouns, adjectives, verbs, conjunctions, whatnot. And then there's other directories that might be like really silly, like things that I think are funny that I want to elaborate on. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> and then I just start constructing the, the cut up. And, and, uh, usually it's a very linear process, but as I gather samples, um, it becomes far more dense, um, mm. as I go. And, you know, th there were like kind of three phases over the past two decades or four. This is like, I would consider the fourth phase, my latest album. Um, the phase previous, previously to this are the albums that I, I gave you all. And um, this was the first time that I actually approached the cut-ups from a first-person perspective. Um, so it is very subjective. Um, <clears throat> and the latest is, is, is not necessarily uh, uh, empirical. It is, it is uh, far more um, speaking through other people. Um, sure. <clears throat> And there's a lot for something that has a, a definite narrative. If you if you listen to the album, you'll you'll find that at, I don't think that a lot of the messaging is incredibly unambiguous. Like I feel right. like you're trying to make the listener feel a certain emotion and then kind of like lead them to water. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's really cool too that it sounds like it's really similar. Uh, Willis is a producer. We all we're all musicians, but Willis is mainly like a producer DJ, and uh, it sounds like your process for getting samples is basically the same. It's just labeled right. the instead of snare, you know, kind right. of thing. So that, right. I, that's really interesting. I never thought about that back that's end right of where the process. I was going basically was like you know you you do use all of these very recognizable things. Like I, I felt like I could name you know like a high percentage of the sources right right and then i all the emotional baggage that came with that right. like material mm -hmm. contributed to the overall feeling of the song which i thought was uh really cool if not a little bit overwhelming at times but yeah, yeah it is very overwhelming and i often get that i mean some of my closest friends want nothing to do with these albums <laughs> um, and that's fine because i understand it is very chaotic and the uh, <clears throat> the approach that i take um, in expressing myself through this type of art is difficult for people to handle. And I'm not in a place to say, oh, well, you don't like this movie, music because you've been conditioned to, uh, you know, the, the sort of Western uh, tradition, uh, mm. like the 12-tone system or whatever it may sure. be. Because um, yeah. there is a lot of dissonance. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of distortion. Um, but through all of that, there's a lot of these really beautiful concepts that are coming out. And almost all the time, if I'm creating an album, I'm reading, um, it's not light reading. It's, it's heavy philosophical problems mm. that I'm dealing with. And I'm thinking of uh, from a collective perspective of what everybody is dealing with. Um, so it is sort of orchestrated to... Um, 
to so it, it is sort of like a score to some degree. Yeah. I don't see it as much different than yeah. a composer writing a symphony. And kind of to, to to harken back to I mean this isn't your first time on the podcast. You're here for the lectern series mm-hmm. too. Yeah. And your kind of uh, a relationship with philosophy and how much time you've spent doing that. Uh, the 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 subject material of the albums isn't easy stuff like you said like it it is uh this is it deals with like religion war you know peace politics um so well ai on the most recent uh, one so so Mm -hmm. media Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it it kind of tries to represent our mental environment which you know Mm -hmm. i kind of back i i kind of take all of my anxiety and package it package it up and put it out into the universe, which is kind of a shitty thing to do because when people listen to it, a lot of the comments I typically get is it makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and then other people are like, no, I've, I listened to it like four or five times and I keep hearing new things that I didn't hear uh, previously. I, I do think that it makes extreme, like it makes, vi- it depends on your listening style. Cause I would say that it makes extremely irritating background music. Like if you put this on, <laughs> it's not try furniture to like, music. <laughs> yeah, you try to clean your kitchen. Shop. You just be like, what the hell? <laughs> well, like, you, I, I've actually done that in the past. And I think the TV's on when I forget that uh, I put on the, the, the album and I'm listening to it and I get distracted and I'm like, what well, the, oh, the TV's on, but it, you know, or even if if you, it, if you're on like a an app like Spotify, it's kind of funny because if you don't pay for it, you get all the ads, and a song will end, and then an ad will come on, and you'll mm. think it's a part of the song. <laughs> it, it also yeah. kind of it, like in a weird way, the audio, like the way it changes, it reminds me of like scrolling through reels sometimes, where you'll mm-hmm. just get like these like mm. you know really like pop culture references that come up one after another, and you don't know what's next, but like you do know that it's connected somehow by your input, right? Um, right. Um, which you know to the to the, to speak to the album like maybe like we have some level of shared experience with growing up right like similar times and yes. being exposed to yes. that kind of pop yes. cultural stuff exactly yeah. yeah i mean we're all kind of going through it so it is sort of a representation of our artificial reality that we've kind of learned to live in mm. um <clears throat> but you know i i came from a, a a classical background i was a pianist as a kid um i started taking music composition lessons when i was in my teens mm. in my early 20s i left to go to san francisco to study with this guy named david conti at the san francisco conservatory mm. and um you know one of the things that my uh uh earlier teacher told me was that he, he never, he said, don't ever lose the attention of your audience. And by listening to these albums, you can kind of see that I drove that into oblivion Yeah, (laughs) Um, and it can have the reverse effect, uh, because you know, it, it changes so much that it can kind of lose your attention, uh, to some degree. Well, Mm. I I think that's kind of what I was talking about when I was talking about the, like the furniture music, the the way you Mm -hmm. recontextualize that, but like it grabs your attention. Like when you hear like, Mm -hmm. you know, like like something really highly recognizable, like the scream from Sabotage or like the opening riff to like, uh, like a Guns N' Roses the song, or, or, <laughs> like yeah. something like that, or some Katy Perry. It like you, it like grabs you. Like, is that what's happening right now? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and this was actually the first album that I I spent a lot of time using music hmm. um, to express myself and using words and music. And that's very difficult because there there are a lot of times where you hear what someone is singing and you think they're singing something different than they actually are. So there were times where I had to like look up lyrics and I'm like, are they really saying that? Um, so there's a lot of movement and it does feel a bit more musical than my previous, previous albums where they were hyper-focused on just voice, um, with music kind of, you know, sporadically thrown, um, throughout it. But this latest work is, I would say most of it is, is music. I, I kind of described it in, in just thinking of how it sounded to me or how it made me I kind of described it as like um, uh, it was some something poetry, like a uh, found sound poetry, or like spliced, and because <clears throat> you're you're taking um, pieces from different parts of of culture and you're blending it together to form something new. So it's kind of like right. creating something from from uh, you know, and and you're like Jacob said, you're pulling all that 
ba- you're bringing a lot of baggage along right, with it as right. you have those like responses to the yeah to the material. It's really it, interesting. It's more of a literary experience mm. to some degree. Yeah, and I would say it's like flash poet or flash poetry, flash but, poetry. On, That's but on a good, speed. Yeah, and you know I have uh, there's there's one. Um, individual out in San Francisco that actually lip syncs at drag shows to my uh, oh, music. Oh, man. Wow. And um, I've thought about, you know, maybe that would be a project that I would like to do to see what it would be like to get like 10 people up on a stage and recite one after another the entire works because I do see it as poetry. Yeah. Wow. Very much so. It'd be It'd be wild to see someone sort of like giving the you know, giving personification to the right. to the speech and to the poem. Right, um, right. Because I think it, it is a little, like, it's it's inherently a bit disconnected in the way mm-hmm. that it's spliced. Um, uh, yeah, and the, one of the other things I noticed that kind of struck me as interesting was that the sounds themselves aren't per se, like, manipulated too much. Mm-mm. In a lot of cases, you're re- representing it kind of as it was, mm-hmm. but you're being very selective about which part is appearing and in in what order and stuff like that. So, I mean, it, it really does a wonderful job of playing with, like, uh, music or sounds in general as being like the experience of something over time right it's like without that element of time and the progression it it just would be totally different so right i appreciated that that they were sort of like raw and like when you heard it it really sparked that and took Mm -hmm. you back yeah i mean definitely the you know part of i've always kind of seen it a little bit like punk rock too because it is raw and I've collaborated with people who are like, man, all your stuff is just peaking. It sounds like shit at times. And, mm. and um, you know, those are the individuals that spend a lot of time mastering. I don't. I don't really, really care about that. I mean, I, I, I play with the levels a little bit. Um, but for the most part, I kind of leave it as is because I kind of like that gritty sound. I specifically said that it, it all sounded really even and well mastered when... Yeah, they played it earlier, so that's oh, really? interesting okay. that you don't listen yeah. to it. Because yeah, especially when you're drawing from such like wide range of sources, you pro- like you could get a whiplash mm-hmm. experience. You could be like, "Oh, I got to right. turn the volume up to hear this part," and then you get blown. Yeah, out. right, but right. I don't, I don't <clears> think <throat> that's what we sensed at all. So I, I did think at some point, like, what the fuck does this project file look like? like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah oh, it's man. pretty. It is pretty nuts. And I, I have like three hard drives full of samples at every project is. Those samples are saved and archived. Mm. Um, and sometimes I'll reuse samples. You know, it's rare that I do, but sometimes I do just because I for- forget that I, <laughs> I already sampled it. Triple Falls is a media and event production company based in southern Minnesota. We specialize in multicam live streaming and sound and lighting for event productions. Contact us today to learn more or subscribe online to join our newsletter and stay up to date about events and things going on in the area. Thanks for tuning in. Back to your show. What are you, you're walking around day to day, like, does it like occur to you like, oh, like you hear something in the grocery store, you're like, oh, oh my actually, God. I got to pull All the time, that. all the mm. time, all the time. I'm probably one of the few people that don't mute commercials. Sure. Um, I watch commercials. Um and yeah, I mean, even even if I have the television on and I'm listening to commercials, I'll hear the samples that I used. Oh, um, fun. And yeah, that's always kind of bizarre because your your brain automatic, automatically hears what's going to come after it yeah. on the album. Yeah, mm. that's a I I have a, a I have a bad experience with sound, and my dad's the same way. Where I don't think that we have the like mental capacity to stop listening. So like, uh, if something, if so, like, I, I have a really hard time working if someone has like music on or oh, something right. like yeah. that. Yeah. So like it, it's, I just can't stop listening to things. So, uh, I, I really do like being in, sometimes it can be really overwhelming to be like in a grocery store or a place where music's playing where right. I'm trying to have another conversation and I'm like, right. You know, right. You have to yeah. tune it out entirely or like listen to mm-hmm. it entirely. Mm-hmm. I have the opposite problem. <clears throat> I can't focus unless I have like some ability to attach like some amount of my attention to something like mm-hmm. I can't like a uh, like a YouTube video that I'm not actually listening to will help me focus on a mixing 
not well not a mixing project because i can't hear something but usually just like some outer form of stimuli i is like needed for me to concentrate right mm. yeah i'm kind of like jacob in that way i mean when i i <clears throat> i'm a developer so i work from home and i never have music on when i mm. work i always work in silence mm. if i have music on it's most likely going to be classical and it does really feel like furniture music where it's not distracting me in any way yeah um what so uh, there there's another element to this music where uh, you know a lot of this stuff isn't actually like uh, usable as as used uh, mm -hmm. and there's probably a whole lot of you know thoughts and feelings you have about that and why it should or shouldn't be done so i i mean you know, listening to it, it, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like someone else's work. Um, <laughs> so like, I, I guess I would probably, you know, pick up for the side of the artist, but I'd, I'd love to hear what you know, think, or have experienced on that front. Um, just about what other individuals do similar type of music? Or oh, I think he's samples. talking like fair use yeah. oh. and like oh, yeah, yeah, not yeah. being able to release <clears throat> your stuff on oh, Spotify. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Like recent, so, um, copyright has, is, often um, sort of a gimmick that a lot of artists do in this genre where, you know, there's bands like Negative Land out in San Francisco who wanted to get sued by U2 and would sample them because they used it in order to market themselves. Um, so they kind of enjoyed getting lawsuits. Uh, we don't really deal with that as much anymore. I mean, I'm locked out of my YouTube account. I've had decease uh, or uh, uh, cease and desist. Yes, yeah. letters sent to me, um, <clears throat> and it always kind of surprises me uh, when that does happen. Actually, the last time I got locked out of YouTube, they forced me to. They wouldn't um, activate my account again unless I watched a a video. That was a cartoon cat dressed as a pirate telling me not to <laughs> sample. <laughs> um, and I actually sampled that uh, <laughs> and used it. Perfect. Um, and got back into my account, but now it's, again, locked. Huh. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of that kind of changed with Girl Talk. Uh, I've, I've known Girl Talk for many, many years. And um, when, when he kind of became popular... I mean, even one reviewer said, you know, this is like standing on the side of the street with a sign that says, I, I sell crack. I mean, you're just asking for lawsuits. Mm. And he, he kind of changed that. He never got sued for it that I know of. Um, mm. And even with music changing, I mean, remember, we used, you know, the music industry used to be really profitable. I don't think it is as much anymore. Mm. Um, so you see a lot of artists kind of going off on their own getting the rights to their music and um that's become a thing so i don't know if copyright is that big of a deal unless somebody at this point would take somebody else's album and uh release it and say it's theirs yeah, yeah. but we are taylor, much taylor more taylor swift's doing that right now right yeah <laughs> <There you go. laughs> <With her album. laughs> yeah I and mean, that's what I, I think it's probably designed to protect <laughs> so against, right? Yeah. It's like someone, you know, releasing yeah. a Katy Perry song as their own and then getting the streaming revenue from it. Right. And, <clears throat> and this feels like a much different kind of experience. Like, I don't think Katy Perry would listen to this and be like, that guy's, that guy's coming yeah. after my... <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. And I mean, again, it's, it's satire. So some people yeah. could be like, well, that affects my, my character, mm. so I'm going to sue him for this. But again, sure. I haven't had that uh issue in the past and mm. it's usually just people don't they're like no i'm not going to print up your vinyl because it's too risky mm. um and even with spotify i uploaded an album the other day and i mean every single album is full of of pop popular music samples and i got flagged on a tony bennett song where he's covering a song yeah. and so all i did was take out that track re-uploaded the album and it passed, and it was fine. Mm -hmm. So I think what's going on is that they have some type of 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 uh, program that listens for how long a sample is played. Because this yeah. particular sample, I played it for probably about thirty seconds. Oh, mm -hmm. for sure. Oh, you know, just just to speak a little bit to this, because this is ridiculous, and this happened on our last podcast where Colin came in. We got flagged 
And it bothers me that AI is doing this because like, yeah, so yeah. like it's clear that no human has any hand in any of this, right, you know, like right. no one's listening, but you know, we, you have the producer of an album saying, Hey, I recorded this. I got consent from all the artists. Here they are. This is our local project. We put our blood, sweat and tears in it. Right. And it's like, well, uh, you know, actually like this is copyrighted content. So, you know, yeah. like they, they, they silenced a part of our podcast and I had to yeah. like, you know, put it on me that it was, you know, our right to use that music, even though if you, if you even looked at the, what was happening in the show for one second, like, you know, they have the algorithm to detect it, but no algorithm to detect whether or not the conversation is actual commentary mm -hmm. yeah. or like who's in it or why right. it's just, it's like, it's really lazy and insulting to yeah. get that kind of an, like an email, like, Oh, like, do you have the right to have the producer of an album come talk about the work they created on your right, show? Right. <laughs> we've, had, we've had issues with that too on live sessions that we posted where a whole song would basically get flagged and muted because, and, and that's a situation where we're having the artists like come play their song on the show. Like they're there performing their own music. And that's getting silenced. Yeah. Oh, that's getting silenced because they're because it they're matches the copyright on, spot, on Spotify. On like some, it's like oh, a it's DMCA like, thing. Like, we're, huh. they're, they're, they're doing, like it's their thing. Yeah. We're right, trying to right, promote it. Right, and, right. And that is, like, I don't know you, if you guys, <laughs> I don't know if you guys already realize this, uh, but uh, <clears throat> this is actually like a really big thing in like the YouTube world. I don't know how much YouTube you guys all consume, but uh, big creators will copyright strike knowing that it'll get overturned smaller creators because larger creators have access to actually talk to a real person and get it fixed. Whereas a creator like Triple Falls would have to go through a whole bureaucratic ladder before any real person looked at it. Mm -hmm. So it's actually heavily taken advantage of by larger artists, uh, knowing that it's, it is fair use and just right. letting robots copyright strike it because they know it'll at least be down for a while. Or maybe a lot of people will just get discouraged. Right. Like just, right. oh, I'm not even going to keep trying to right. upload this. So it's actually a pretty big problem. And there's been huge lawsuits of it. Uh, Ethan Klein from H3H3 went through like a two-year lawsuit on fair use for video. And so I'm kind of surprised it's not the same thing with audio. Like the whole argument is like, how long are you playing it? And are you actually adding to the content or are you just like, because, you know, there's reaction people on YouTube that will literally like play a video in its entirety, like eating popcorn. Like, right. I think that's pretty obviously not adding to the content and is just playing it. But I've seen a lot of, uh, how do you say, like uh, people who tell like true crime stories and yeah. then like reaction YouTubers just being like. Yeah, like, yeah. And it's like, you're just like, that's what you should be yep. doing in the audience if they're doing a good job. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you're just being a YouTube consumer yeah. on YouTube. Like, it's yeah. the worst content ever. Sniper Wolf's the big <clears throat> conversation right now. Yeah, she, she like literally just plays TikToks, gives no credit to the creators, and will literally go like, oh my gosh, and then play the next one. Mm, and yeah. it's like, that's I've, clearly a different thing than you spending hours like... toiling over this, <laughs> playing 30 <laughs> seconds of a song that no one's going to be like, oh man, this is a way better version of Tony Bennett. Like, that's right, not right, why you're listening right, to right, it. Right. <laughs> it's almost like spam content or something. But I wonder, like, even in some cases, <clears throat> I've discovered content that I like on TikTok through that. Yep. And then like, I'm like, okay, but this is a spam account and I'll go like search. I, but... I don't know, like we just want the 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 real thing to to do better and to be shown to you, right, you know? right. But instead, the one that you see is the one where there's a little car driving, yeah, falling yeah. down a hill or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you are like someone like cleaning a hundred year old like pencil sharpener, <laughs> <laughs> like on the side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like what? I I could work to a video of someone cleaning a pencil sharpener. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I could I could handle that. Like I'd look over, I'm like, wow, that guy's got way more done than I have. <laughs> it's like oddly motivating. Uh, oh, wow, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah. Is there any like particular vision for this project, or is <clears throat> as something that at least in the current market you can't really make money off of? It seems like you don't. Know, it's good. You got to have a good amount of passion in it. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm incredibly grateful that I I don't 
depend on this project financially whatsoever. Yeah. So I typically, mm-hmm. I really don't like asking money for, for anything when it comes to iCut people. Yeah. Um, I kind of try to keep a separation, even on Bandcamp, everything's marked at zero. You have to put, well, let people pay what they want and that's fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I do have my vinyl on there for sale, but usually if somebody buys one, I send them all of them mm-hmm. just to, just to, you know, just to be able to share it. Um, but you know, I'm fortunate to be in that position because yeah. a lot of people aren't, mm-hmm. um, able to do that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like what I think Nietzsche called it, the uh, fortunate accident of success where, you know, some people just experience success and it's not even by its fate, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not really determined. Um, but I don't know how I would approach it if, if there were for some reason, you know, high expectations for me to ever release an album that Mm. I would, I don't even, I don't even think I would like that at all. Um, but what is it just put that in there? At the beginning of the yeah, album, right. you can use that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, did it, uh, what is it? Is it like a conversation, too, where you're like, I, you know, it's been a little while. Like, I feel like there's stuff going on that I got to, like, process. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, I know. Is that kind of how it works? Yep, that's exactly how it works. And I, this album, this re- recent release, it took me a, about a year to build. Usually it doesn't take me that long. Hmm. Um, but... <clears throat> Uh, I feel so incredibly stable in my life. And usually whenever I'm unstable is whenever I produce the best art, mm. uh, which kind of sounds trite, but whatever. Mm. Um, but so I was, I was kind of thinking, well, I, I don't even know if I can do this. Cause, but, but mm-hmm. what I, what I did with this one when I, d- I didn't do on the last five is that I felt like I kind of spoke through other people. So it was a more empathetic album been entirely subjective and concerned with my own like mental environment. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think that's why it, it feels like, uh, growth more than any of my other albums that I've released. Okay. What, uh, what inspired it? Like what made you, do you remember if there was like a moment in the last couple of years where you're like, okay, this now we got to do an album on this. Yeah. So the, the main foundational concept of this album is, uh, the ego replacing God. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, they kind of contradict each other because it, the, the, the album is, there's a lot of blasphemy in the album. So it's not me saying, Oh, we shouldn't, you know, replace God. Um, but uh, the the sort of the the concept of self self um, worth and um, selfishness in our society, I think, drives the system. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if we look back at uh, what was it, the 1700s, when the uh, Adam Smith, the forefather of economic theory, stated that uh, that uh, by nature people um, are only interest or are self-interested. And if you let people be self-interested, then that will benefit the economy. Um, so really the concept of the ego runs parallel with capitalism. It, it empowers capitalism. Mm. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't be ego. I think ego is necessary. I would say ego is necessary for physiological needs for the most part. Um, but, uh, so a lot of the album does kind of, you'll, you'll hear it throughout it where I'll, I'll sample someone talk about God and then it'll go into ego or somebody will say, I'm an individual and, or I'm a, I'm a God. And I'm like, no, no, no. You know, it's just Mm. kind of like going back and forth. Um, but I'm, I'm really, really interested in the philosophy of Jean Paul Sartre and Sartre believe that the ego was an object for consciousness and he was a realist. So he's, he wasn't one of those philosophers that said that tree out there doesn't exist if I don't exist. Um, <clears throat> which is kind of a superiority complex in my opinion, to think that that tree wouldn't exist because I don't exist. Yeah. That, that's Sartre, uh, pretty selfish. Right. It, it totally is. And Sartre's a realist. So he's like, no, 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 no. Consciousness exists because of objects. Consciousness wouldn't exist without objects. 
Um, so for him, uh, ego was an object for consciousness, and it's how we interact in the world of objects. Uh, but as with all philosophers, often people with uh, certain political agendas take on those philosophies and those ideologies that they uh, that are just you know theories, and they run with it. It's kind of like when you think about Darwin and the survival of the fittest. Oh, yeah, that, that hasn't been used for all the best things. Right, right. And Darwin was not talking about survival of the fittest within the capitalistic system at all. He was talking about it from a biological perspective. Um, so you often see that. You even see it in Nietzsche's work. When Nietzsche uh, wrote The Will to Power, he decided not to publish it. Uh, the original manuscript has a grocery list written over some of the most profound ideas in the book. Mm. Um, and that book was adopted by the Nazis. Um, and, uh, you know, Nietzsche's name was dragged through the mud for decades after that. Mm. Um, but that's, that's, that's very, very common, I believe. Um, well, and there's a lot of good that can come from this, uh, from like what the ego does. Like, I, you know, most people who are creating art have enough touch of like the desire to make themselves heard. Because, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of people could take the same notes that you've clearly gathered and put forth and just go be sad. Right. You know, right. but like instead you made six albums and we right. can talk about it and share it with people. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does. It is very important. I, I think it's how you approach it. Um if I was concerned with admiration, I, I think that would be like, that seems like why uh, a lot of artists suffer m the most from is that they want success. They want admiration. Mm -hmm. And the returns on the dividends. You know, right, like, right, exactly. I put my love into this, where's but my... it's Yeah, but it's also very important that they get a response because a response is, is to some degree necessary. I would I would like an inspired response more than a... Um, you know, and, you know, someone looking up to me as a leader, that, that sounds like a nightmare. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I think we could also use less of that in our society. Um, if we looked at the, the whole, uh, the whole collective as the leader, uh, rather than one, you know, individual that we rely upon, um, Oh, I would think yeah. that the world would be in a much better place. <laughs> I, I agree with you because, you know, thought leaders, for, for what they end up becoming, you know, almost always, you know, buckle under the pressure of what they become. You know, right. a lot of people do their, especially in social media environments, you know, you, you get out there and you say something that really resonates with people and then you have to exist in the environment that created your fame. Right. And then, you know, you start, you start not, living in the circumstances that created that level of empathy. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you, you see that even in music. Um, you see it all over the place where, mm -hmm. um, where um, <clears throat> it's kind of like the idea that, like, for me, music is very sacred. Um, and it's kind of like going into a church and seeing that there's a, there's a gift shop in the lobby. It's like they just destroyed everything that was sacred about that philosophy, um, and <clears throat> you see it, you see shirts with Che Guevara or Bob Marley and, you know, all these people that had very like strong passions and then they throw their face on a shirt and make it a commodity mm. and it just devalues everything that they believed in. Mm. And I don't know if there's like a large conspiracy around that, you know, if, if that's done on purpose. <laughs> but large conspiracy around making a quick buck. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it, what, it, what it boils down to is that it's, it's all for profit. Yeah. You know, the end is profit in our society. Um, that's how you get ahead. You don't get ahead if the end is life or in Kant, Immanuel Kant's view, humanity. I would change that with just living things, uh, even non-living things. Um, but, but uh, yeah, it, it, you just it, it, our system is set up to where, in order to survive, your end needs to be to some degree profit. You know, doing this for a few years now, I have found and have tried to replicate in myself that many of the most successful artists that come through here like save something for themselves. Like they know that they've commodified their art, mm -hmm. but like they continue to do something that is 
completely unmarketable, like something right. that kind of like nurtures whatever the original seed that, you know, created right. what brought them to right. where they are now. And, you know, when you get to hear them talk about it, it is really, you know, quite special, I think. Um, and I wish that more people, like people, especially people who don't consider themselves to be artists would realize like what they create is important regardless if anyone, you know, if, right. you, if you just yeah. make stuff yeah. for you and it makes you extremely happy, like it is art, it is good. It is worthy of showing to people and you never have to make a dime. Right. And, and mm. <clears throat> I've, I've said that exact same thing over and over. And part of me sometimes questions that cause I'm like, well, is that selfish? But at the same time, it's, it's like, no, it's kind of something that you fall back on during times of suffering. And and if 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 you if you limit your art to the amount of people that like it, um there's going to be very few people that are going to be happy with what they what they make. I also think it's harder for your voice to come through unless you and when you're making art for other people. Uh, oh right. Uh, I the where I see it the most is comedy. Uh, Ninety percent of people are funnier when they stop trying to be funny. Right. It's yeah. like uh, that I, idea that like, tell me about like you could probably be funnier telling me about the day you had than about like weed or something simply because <laughs> it's the experience only you have. But right. weed is funny. But weed is funny. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've made money on ten minute sets about weed. Don't get me wrong, but. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like a voice thing. I think with the when you try too hard to make stuff for other people, you're like losing, and it might work out for a while. But then when you once you come to the end, you like lose the thing that made it your voice anyway, and now like you lose your followers. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could use the example of Nirvana. I mean, yeah. A great example is Nevermind. I mean, yeah. Do you think Kurt Cobain really? really liked that album at all yeah, yeah. at least all the interviews i've seen of him he really disliked it mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and, and it's the album any kid today is going to be wearing as it right as a and it's it's it was the album that was most uh that was easy to market and then they release in you know they re release incesticide after that and nobody even remembers that one um or even in utero was much more in line with what they wanted to make and that wasn't even that like uh you know, that, that wasn't that popular when it came out, at least from when I remember it. Is it about, like, finding a place of balance then? Or is it, like, it's all just screwed and there's, I mean, you know, how do, yeah. how do you think about, I mean, your approach seems like you're going you're gonna to do what you want in this project. Right, but right. how would you think about it and, you know, the examples of Nirvana well, or something? <clears> like, is I it think, kind of about that balance? Yeah, I mean, it can be. I mean... <clears throat> there's plenty of artists. I, I think uh, a great example of someone who stayed true to their style um, and kind of still remains fairly underground is Tom Waits. I mean, yeah. Tom Waits yeah. is a great example of someone that never really um, did anything for his audience. Um, and uh, so I think it is, it is possible. I think it's, it becomes more difficult earlier on if if you're if you're in that state where you're financially dependent on your art and you're willing to do anything, you know, mm. and yeah. sell sell out in order to there's uh, a gain long game on that. Like you look at the music yeah. of Tom Waits though, because like it and like he is he he does like air toward punk. I would say like does, especially yeah. in in his newer <clears throat> stuff. And I I really like some of the older stuff. I like Rain Dogs. I like Heart Attack and Vine. Agreed, yeah. I really like that stuff. But, you know, the, the more modern stuff is, like, I, way darker, I feel. It is. It's very dark. And I actually, when I was living in California, I lived in the same town as Tom Waits. And he would, he would I worked at a co-op, and he would come in, and we would have the most bizarre conversations around what type of protein is, is the best type of protein, whether it's animal mm. or hemp. And he's a very bizarre uh, man. But he would come in with his son, who he just took to a baseball game. So, so much of his personality yeah. is very much an act. Like mm -hmm. he's performing, but then he has this, you know, when you see him out in public, he's like this like kind of regular guy. Yeah. yeah. You know? His stuff always really spoke to me when I was younger too, just because it was so 
weird and uh it felt like it felt like i was at like the circus or something i don't know quite oh, yeah, know how no, to describe well, it yeah i mean he always has like those uh those what are those organs called calliopes and, yeah, you yeah. Know, those mm. the circus organs playing and um oh. yeah his his work has always been very inspiring i was introduced to him in the 90s through bone machine which oh, okay. just an incredible album yeah that's when uh, my a guy I play with eli that's like his favorite album yeah yeah, yeah. i think it's, swan's got a similar treatment too like they had like a big bump in the 80s and then t- 2010s came around and like you know it yeah. that just huge like right yeah. right right you know who i think actually might be a good example of it and it might sound funny but i actually think icp is a really good example of this uh they got told by the whole industry they were gonna fail and that no one would like it, and that, and I'm not even, I'm not like a huge ICP fan. But when I was younger, I used to like kind of hate them because I thought they were like taking advantage of people, and they they like very much aren't. They're like, now this is like our actual art, and now we have like not many bands have whole multi day festivals around them, right, and right. stuff like that. And I think that's a perfect example of just like now we're gonna stay true to the thing that we know we have, and yeah. Right. I know that's kind of a weird example to put against Tom Waits. Insane clown posse. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> not not I cut people. No, no, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> oh yeah, what were we talking about? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I had festivals. Yeah, yeah. That's I didn't even put that together in my head. That's so funny. <laughs> Did you know what about uh, you? Well. One of the first albums I bought was an Insane Clown Posse <laughs> album because I wanted to, I, when I was a kid, I was like a juggler and a unicycler and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I legitimately thought it was going to be like clown music. And, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I got home and I'm like, I can't juggle to this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I like that you wanted it to be clown music yeah. as, as if clown music is at all like... <laughs> Uh, so we need more. Yeah, <laughs> we do need more clowns. Yeah, I could, I could start that music for. Clowns. I have a small pump organ. I could totally play like little uh, chromatic scales. I love that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, well, are there? So we we touched a little bit on the most recent <laughs> album. Are there any of the other albums that you brought for us today, or have uh, worked on that you want to? kind of speak about that that sort of like represents your approach to the mm-hmm. the format or uh yeah the- i mean i i think uh so when i was in like the second phase of the project i sampled mostly movies i never um i printed those up on cd but <clears throat> and they would just it was all for movie sources so there was mm. one called the inside story and there was another one that looked like a netflix package and um and those were those were great, but again, they didn't re- they they didn't feel as raw as um, <clears throat> when I when I released Miserable Day. That one was okay. was uh, during a time where I had taken a four year hi- hiatus to like focus on development, and um, that one I was so incredibly bitter at the time and pessimistic. And this one was just me expressing myself. So this one's kind of, it's incredibly dark. There's, Mm. there's many, many cuts that talk about, you know, committing suicide and, um, it's very offensive and lewd, (laughs) (laughs) um, but it's actually one of my favorites. Mm. And, um, so I kind of started at that point and there's a progression through all of those albums, um, and it kind of went from being very pessimistic to more optimistic. And, and um, so there's, those albums are incredibly special to me because mm. for me, they're, it's kind of like a diary uh, over the course of, of five or six years. Do, mm. you, do you, you write this as text beforehand, like a lot of it? No, not at all. I have a uh, farewell reality. I have listened back to that and wrote out every single word in that. And you can actually read those on my website. Mm. Um, I thought about doing that for all albums, but it's, it's just, it's a ton of work and yeah. I have to motivate myself to do it. Um, but no, I don't. It's again, it's, it's all kind of, uh, I would explain it. It's kind of like a trance. I mean, you, you, Sometimes you're you're not thinking about a, a particular subject, but you you 
you make a cut of it and then afterwards I realized what I was writing about, but I didn't even notice that I was writing about that during that moment. Mm. Um, and so those, those albums again are just, they kind of got me through those, those six years mm. of my life. Oh my gosh. I just, so is, is your, is the name because you <laughs> cut samples of people? Yes. I just, yeah, I just got that. It's aptly titled. I would yeah, have yeah. worn a thicker shirt. I thought it was just like punk or something. I didn't know. Yeah, I, I, I didn't just got it. it. I didn't get it until the, his intro explanation. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, I just last year went to a dying fetus show, and I doubt that their name is based on something like that. So I was just like, oh, he cuts people. Yeah, yeah that's right, a good name. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, cool. no, it's, I actually, the, the name came from, I was living in this really small town in California called Guerneville, and I was, I was uh, 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 displaying a lot of collages that I did at the time and, and kind of handing out my work, mm. and uh, somebody had wrote on my car, one morning I came out to my car and somebody wrote, I cut people, and I was like, oh, man, that's, mm. I got to use that. Yeah. So did it, it started in a way from uh, visual arts as well? Is that something that you've yeah. explored with this project? Yep. It all started, um, I mean, it started when I was living in San Francisco and a group of friends, we would, we would fill up our samplers with all kinds of like found sounds, television samples or whatever. And then we'd all get together and we would have improvs. Mm. And, you know, 90% of the time, these improvs were nothing but chaos. Mm. Um, but there were those moments where suddenly one person played a sample and I would respond or somebody else would respond. And when we listen back to those, uh, th those, those improvs afterwards, that got the most response. We always thought it was hilarious and we would react to it. And so mm. at that time, I was like, well, I'm just going to start creating albums where it's just nothing but I'm just being very intentional with everything I say in it mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, just a bunch of samples going on at the did, same time. Is, did you start on like a, a hardware sampler? You're like loading floppy disks into an Akai? <laughs> oh gosh, no. Um, <clears throat> I started with a doctor sampler. It's like a, I think it's 301. It was like one of the first ones. That oh, came out. a boss yeah. product. Yes. Doctor sample. And I, yeah. Yep. Roland. It was boss, but now it's Roland, Roland I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we all kind of had those, those samplers. Um, and then for live performances, uh, I would load up about, I don't know, maybe two of those and then, uh, have my computer and perform that way. But that was, it was, you know, it's like months of preparation to play that live. Cause I just didn't yeah. want to get up in front of people and play and then act like I was doing something. So I wanted to do something. So what I would do is I would take the entire sound file of what I was playing and I would cut out samples, put them in the sampler and then mark those in my, uh, my, uh, software. So I knew when the mark was coming up and I'd stop the computer, play the sample, go back mm. and just do that. So there was some type of movement. Yeah. Is this uh, is this something that exists in live performance format at all right now, or is this? Just um, I've never played. I've never played any of these live. I played all my okay. movie albums live in California, and those exist on my my YouTube account. Okay. Uh, there might be one live performance video that I did um, that I have on there. Um, but since moving to uh, back to the Midwest, um, uh, I haven't performed live. I did. I did do uh, a live um, performance with uh, Holly Dodge whenever she did her thesis at the Masonic Center. Mm. And I, <clears throat> when she read her poems, I was playing sort of very soft, um, uh, like, you know, sound collages going on underneath, but no words or anything like that. Mm. It's an it's an interesting format. Uh, we spoke recently with a friend of the show, uh, Calvin uh, Porter, who we talked about it before as being somewhat, uh, I don't know, might be on the same sh record collection shelf as some mm -hmm. of the stuff. It's yeah. kind of like, uh, how was his it's, uh, it's called Grind Step. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, similar to Grindcore in the way that it's like purposely kind of an 
abrasive thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I can tell of what I've learned of the genres, there's definitely like a comedy element. It's kind of like comedy for producers. Oh, I love but that. But it, it yeah. gets like pretty heavy sometimes. But I love it. I, I, I've listened to, they're called Bajalvin. Yeah. It's and, very uh, meme. It's like, got a yeah, really it's wild meme energy in the room too. Like they're playing it, they're playing it live out yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So I've been trying to, I've been like interested in the format where people are doing... <clears throat> Um, sampling non traditional like performance styles. You yeah. right. show up to a, a gig like dressed like head to toe in SpongeBob gear. <laughs> yeah. Like yellow trip pants, SpongeBob shirt, SpongeBob hat, SpongeBob mm -hmm. lunchbox. And, like, <laughs> it honestly <laughs> reminds me of like Tim and Eric mm -hmm. DJ music, but, but they're both like very serious producers and like really know what they're doing and like are DJs by trade. Right. But they just make, it's so weird. I don't even know how to describe it, but I really like it. Yeah, no, I think it, a mm. lot of, uh, you know, people not as worried about copyright hopefully will open up the door to more of this more sample yeah. based yeah. music. It seems to be like a like a full-fledged genre at this point. Like there's quite a few bands in right, it. Yeah, and right. it's called Grind's well, Step there one is. <clears throat> Cut-ups were initially, I mean, you know, they were they were kind of exposed by uh, Burroughs. I mean, people were doing it before Burroughs, but he kind of, you know, he started doing the the uh, the Cut-ups in uh, literature and um there's also a guy who I don't I don't think he's making any more albums, but he actually uh, a lot of his albums he he was doing it whenever the only way you could do it was through uh, splicing tape. Oh wow! Oh. So his so all of his work is it's very very simple, but it is in that form where it's like you know says something and then says something else and then says something else, but it's oh. just not it's not as dense. It seems so meticulous. <clears throat> yeah, yeah his wild. name's Wayne Butane. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, he's like some old guy in Arizona, uh. um, but he's he's kind of the closest I think uh, to uh, the music that I make. Um, Have you uh, heard of the Avalanches by chance? Mm -mm. That's probably the most uh, quote unquote mainstream thing like this I could think of. They uh, make, they're definitely like hip hop mm -hmm. inspired records, but it's tons of samples like this. Like uh, one co is called Frontier Psychologist. Uh, that's probably their most popular song. And it has like samples of a little girl talking to a psychologist. It has like uh, samples from a Western movies of like two cowboys about to fight. Oh, right. Yeah, and yeah. like just all it's hundreds of weird samples like that. Yeah. And yeah. That's that's uh, people like us and over in London. She she does. She only works with records, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but usually she'll use like a repeating beat under and then she'll have like samples of like old cowboy movies movies yeah. and people it's and very much like sometimes that. even like fart noises yeah, and yeah. like that <laughs> no that's yeah. that's very mu much like what i'm talking about yeah right yeah. yeah when i was listening to your record i was trying to think about how it could be live performed and it's so fast and so meticulous that i can't imagine you could play like the individual pieces well and so then you're left like yeah, I mean, you chunks. just, it's, yeah, it's it, like you really don't have a choice unless you have uh, the time uh, and the resources to have a lot of people all playing samplers at the mm. same time, oh. yeah. which would be really cool. But, and, you know, maybe that's like a reason to like write a grant for something like yeah. that. But I kind of, I really like the format too, where you have someone who's projecting it as like a per, you know, yeah, pers me too. personifying it. That yeah. seems like a cool yeah. way to kind of be like, eh, it's not, you know, we're not like playing the samples yeah. in order. Mm -hmm. The Frontier um, Psychologist yeah. songs music video is literally that. Like okay. people acting out the, the various samples yeah. as a yeah. music video. Yep, yep. Cool. Yeah. I think that's a great, I, I, I would go see that. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I <clears throat> I always attend writer's block and I, I never get up there and talk. I just attend with Holly because she often... Uh, recites poetry there and i was trying to think of of a way i could contribute to that without reading like some obscure philosophy mm. um but doing it from a more uh, poetic way yeah and that's the only thing i can really think of doing mm -hmm. hmm. well if someone's listened to this and they're interested in checking it out finding out more uh catching a <clears throat> catching a record <clears throat> listening where can they where can they find it all 
Well, I, I'm not really on social media. I have a personal account on Instagram, but uh, it is just all personal. Um, and so, yeah, I would probably, I, I, I still, I still kind of direct people to my website. Um, and then there's also, you know, I'm on Bandcamp, so that's another good resource to kind of go in and and purchase something if you want to. But again, like just download it for free. Yeah, that's where that's where we listened. Uh, it was, it's free. Listen to it. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely worth checking out. Is there anything you want to uh, share about it before we kind of wrap up here? I think. We've touched on a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm sure we could go deeper. But no, yeah, no, I appreciate you guys having me. I, I, um, this is actually, I rarely do any kind of, uh, I rarely talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I'll probably, I probably spend more time talking about playing piano than I do these records. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I'm very grateful for you guys having me on. Yeah, okay. thanks for coming. It was, it was cool. You know, it, it, I like, I. It's interesting whenever I find that someone else that has, I've already like learned about one thing that they do and then they have a whole nother. Right. Yeah. yeah I yeah. love that. Facet. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. So really thanks awesome. for, thanks for putting it together. Thanks yeah, for coming thank on. You guys. Thanks, thanks for the for albums. Sure. It's cool. Yeah. Really cool. That was yeah. really cool. Yeah.